Unplugged by Gordon Corman. Read by Keith McCarthy. Chapter 1 Jet Baranov. Matt says I could see the majestic beauty of the American Southeast if I'd bother to glance out the window. So I glance. Clouds, I report. Whoop de doo. I've got all the majestic beauty I need right here. I've got a private plane cruising at 28,000 feet. I've got two flight attendants who bring me snacks and sodas every time they think I look hungry or thirsty. I've got super fast internet, even though we're flying way above any cell network. My phone connects to a system of satellites, thanks to a tiny chip designed by Fuego, the tech company started by my father. Right now, the screen shows the selfie I just took, slightly enhanced using Fuego's state-of-the-art editing software. I add a caption, jet on a jet. If that's not meme-worthy, I don't know what is. With a swipe, I upload it to the Fuego app. Matt rolls his eyes when the image appears on his screen. He follows all my social media, but he's not a buddy. Warden might be a better word, or at least babysitter. My father, Matt's boss, put him in charge of keeping me out of trouble. That might be the hardest job in Silicon Valley right now. Quantum computing is patty cake compared with trying to make me do something I don't want to do. That's kind of a point of pride with me. Jet on a jet, he challenges. Really? 60 grand a year for the finest schools and that's the best you can come up with? It's insightful commentary on my life, I insist. Dad loves this plane more than he loves me. He even named me after it. And the extra T stands for trouble, Matt adds quoting my father's often-repeated comment. Yes, the famous Vladimir Baranov, billionaire founder of Fuego, cracks dumb dad jokes like all the other fathers. The plane's official name is the Del Fuego. Our 40-acre compound in Silicon Valley is known as Casa Del Fuego. You get the picture. I've named my toilet the Fuego Bowl. Back in December, I set off a bunch of cherry bombs in it to see if I could trigger the Fuego detector in the hall. Verdict, success. I also found out that our whole house is outfitted with emergency sprinklers. Vlad was pretty ticked off about that. How was I supposed to know? My family's all about fuego, not agua. Come think of it, that was just about when Matt began spending a lot more time in the company of his boss's son. Matt Luganis started out as a high-flying young programmer at Fuego. Lately, though, his job seems to be keeper, I feel a little bad about that. Matt signed on with Fuego to change the world, not ride with me in the limo to school to make sure I actually get there, or to be an extra chaperone at the Halloween dance to prevent a repeat of the last Halloween dance, when I hired a local motorcycle gang to ride their Harleys into the gym. There were a lot of tall 8th graders last year, so it took a couple of minutes for the teachers to realize that the newcomers weren't actually students. Hey, I'm just having fun. Sometimes you have to work at it. It's harder than it looks, you know. I have a saying. Fertilizer, meat, fam. I originally had another word for the first part, but it already got me kicked out of my private school, my third in three years, by the way. My mother flew all the way back from Ulaanbaatar to straighten things out, starting with me. Vlad says what I really need is to find some friends. That's also harder than it looks. People expect me to be a stuck-up rich kid, so they stay away. Whatever. I've gotten pretty good at lone-wolfing it. Too good, some people think. Bay Area Weekly just named me Silicon Valley's number one spoiled brat. Remember, we're talking about California. Think of all the other spoiled brats I had to beat out for that title. Vlad always says I should aim for the best. Besides, I've always got Matt. He's 27, but he still counts as a friend. I mean, I think he'd still hang out with me even if his boss didn't tell him to. Yeah, right. I'm sure he can even think of a million things he'd rather do. The pilot makes an announcement to fasten our seatbelts and turn off all electronics. As usual, I ignore both messages. Matt's exasperated. Your name may be Baranoff, but your head can split open the same as anybody else's. So I sigh and fasten my seatbelt, but I pull a blanket over my lap so Matt won't see. When we're on the tarmac and they open the door to let us out, the blast of heat and humidity nearly knocks me back into the galley. What is this place? The Amazon jungle? Matt grins right in my face. 
Welcome to Arkansas. No, seriously, I tell him. He's solemn. This is Little Rock, Arkansas. We've still got a three-hour drive ahead of us from here. To where? The moon? He reaches back and pulls me down the stairs to the tarmac. Listen, Jed, the sprinkler thing was bad enough. When the floors warped, your poor father had to get the replacement wood imported from special cedars in Lebanon. My science teacher says a cherry bomb has more than a gram of flash powder, I explain. Sue me for being curious. Matt's not done yet. Was it curiosity that made you drive that go-kart off Fisherman's Wharf? Lucky for you, I was able to kill the story before it went viral on Twitter. But when you pulled that little stunt with the drone... Well, you can't blame me for that. I was just trying to get a few aerial shots of Emma, Emma Loudermilk's pool party. The problem was that sitting between my house and hers is San Francisco Airport. Fertilizer, meat fan. That wasn't my fault, I defend myself. How was I supposed to know that the Air Force was going to scramble fighter jets to shoot down one little drone? Or that the pieces were going to break so many windshields in the parking lot? Don't act so surprised, Matt tells me firmly, steering me toward the terminal building. This isn't the first time your antics got you into a little too much attention and you had to lie low for a while. Yeah, I agree. But lying low is a couple weeks on the Riviera, or maybe Bali, not Arizona. Arkansas, he corrects me. So who's going to know if the two of us get back on the plane, fuel up, and fly someplace decent? Remember that private surf island off Australia where everybody gets their own chef? He cuts me off. Forget it, Jet. Your dad's right on top of this. The place we're going has a wait list, waiting list. You had to pull a lot of strings to get, it, get us in this summer. Waiting list, huh? I like the sound of that. In Silicon Valley, if you don't have to pull strings to get into something, it probably isn't worth getting into. What is it, some kind of sick new resort? And they put it in Arkansas to scare away the uncool people? He smiles. Something like that. Come on, the Range Rover's waiting for us. I'm encouraged, but something about his cake-eating grin makes me uneasy. Especially when I see the car, which is splashed with mud and pockmarked in a dozen places, this isn't the kind of Range Rover from the rap songs. It's the kind you ship to Africa to drive over the elephant poop. It's ten times hotter inside the car than outside it. The air conditioning isn't broken. It just doesn't exist. The driver is either named Buddy or wants us to consider him our, our buddy. I'm not sure which. He assures us we don't need air conditioning. A certain amount of sweating is good for you, he calls over the engine's roar. It's part of the program. Keeps your skin pores open. You're cooler in the long run. Program? I ask Matt suspiciously. He just shrugs. The breeze feels like it's coming from a hair dryer set on fricassee. But after an hour on the road, I don't even care that I'm sweat drenched from head to toe. Where are we? I hiss. How much worse is this going to get? We're on our way, he insists. To the, uh, resort. But he doesn't look too happy either. Maybe the bumpy two-lane road is messing with his stomach. No resort I ever went to had an approach like this. Couldn't we have gone by helicopter or float plane? He shakes his head. This place is really remote. Tell me about it. I haven't seen a solitary soul in 20 miles that didn't have feathers or four legs. If this resort had a waiting list? I'd hate to see the one that nobody wants to go to. Another hour goes by. The scenery doesn't change. Standing by the side of the road, a deer looks at me as we pass by. I swear there's pity in his eyes. There are signs that talk about towns, but we never see any. By this time, I'm not just physically miserable and bored out of my mind, I'm also starving. I'd give a thousand preferred shares of Fuego stock for a bag of Doritos. The luxury of the Gulfstream feels like it happened another lifetime ago. A way better one. Finally, three hours in, we get there. I look around for the trappings of a vacation hotspot. Palm trees, towering water slides, gleaming hotel buildings. Nothing. There's a small sign by the main entrance. The Oasis of Mind and Body Wellness. I turn to Matt. Wellness? This is the place, he confirms. Your dad set the whole thing up. How do I even describe it? A lot of words come to mind. None of them resort. It's decently large, surrounded by woods, with small, neat cottages dotted all over the property. There's a few bigger buildings, too, 
but none higher than a single story. It isn't a dump, nothing is falling apart, and it's all freshly painted and well-maintained. It isn't totally unfun. There's a pool, at least, the kind any crummy motel would have. No water slides or anything cool like that. There are people on bikes and, in the distance, kayaker kayaking and pedal boating on a lake. What can I say? It's sort of okay, but it's definitely not the kind of high-ended destination where you get your own chef. My father picked this place? No way. The driver takes us to the welcome center so we can check in. I tug on Matt's arm. I don't get it. Why would Vlad send me clear across the country and hours into the wilderness to a place that doesn't have anything half as good as the stuff at our own house? Take it easy. And what's this whole wellness thing? I'm not sick. We're all sick, comes a rich female voice, smooth as melted caramel, from behind the counter. In fact, the moment we're born, we immediately begin dying. Picture the most intimidating woman you've ever seen like a supermodel on the body of one of those female wrestlers in WWE. The figure who stands up from her chair must be six feet four, yet she carries herself with a cat-like ease and grace. She has a huge, huge pale gray eyes that are closer to silver. Her hair is almost silver too, with the of it. It's close cropped. I swear it's shorter than mine. I'm so tempted to stare at her that I have to look away. Uh, hi, Matt says, clearly thrown. I'm Matt Luganis, and this is Jet Baranoff. Checking in? I envy you, the lady informs us in that almost musical tone. No part of the journey is ever quite as eye-opening as the first step. I'm Ivory Nor Norvis. I'm in charge of meditation here. Meditation, I echo. This is the oasis of mind and body wellness. We heal the body through diet and exercise. The mind, on the other hand, is a more complicated instrument. The valves of a trumpet can be oiled. Only meditation can tune the mind. Huh? I've heard of math teachers and English teachers, I tell her, but meditation teachers? That's a new one. Here at the Oasis, we say pathfinder, not teacher. I cannot plant information inside your head. I can only show you the path to understanding. Every time Ivory Norvis opens her mouth, a lot of serious weirdness comes out. I blurt, You know that waiting list? Is it to get in or get out? Ivory laughs and then holds out her hand. Matt moves to shake it, but that's not what she has in mind. Your phones, gentlemen, she tells us. A great fear clutches at my heart. What about them? You have to turn them in. Ivory explains like it's the most obvious thing in the world. It's the one strict rule at Oasis. No electronics. On the path to wellness, the only screen you need is the vast blank slate of your imagination. I'm psyched. Finally, we come to the part where Matt tells me tells this Wonder Woman on steroids where she can stick her Oasis. So it's a blow when I see him hand over his beloved F-phone like it's nothing. You knew about this? I accuse him. He nods grimly. And so did your father. That's when it dawns on me. Vlad didn't send me here to line low. He sent me here for revenge, just because he had to pay back the Air Force for scrambling those fighter planes. Matt shakes his head solemnly. Your father loves you. He sent you here because you need this. Silicon Valley's number one spoiled brat? That looks cute in a magazine. But these stunts of yours are getting out of hand. What if a piece of that drone had gone through somebody's skull instead of just their windshield? One of these days, you're going to do something that your father can't buy you out of. He's trying to save your life, Jet, and so am I. He plucks my phone out of my pocket and hands it to Ms. Meditation. I fold my arms across my chest. I'm not staying. In answer, he reaches into my bag and pulls out my F-pad and my laptop and surrenders those too. Then he takes a smartwatch right off my wrist and tosses it across the counter. You're fired, I snarl. He's patient. Remember Liam Reardon? A kid in my school. His dad owns like half of Google. What about him? He was a zombie. He never looked away from a screen long enough to make eye contact with a real human. He was hostile, antisocial. He'd gone through every therapist in the Bay Area and half the of the ones in L.A. Then his parents sent him here. His meditation nods. 
Liam, wonderful boy. The oasis made such a difference for him, as, as it will for you. The silver eyes bore into me at high intensity until I have to study my sneakers to avoid the onslaught. The coming weeks will be the turning point of your spiritual life. I don't have a spiritual life, I reply stubbornly. Some crazy lady stole it along with my phone. If Ivory is offended by that, she doesn't let on. Hostility is the byproduct of a mind out of balance, she nods, she says understandingly. At least I have a mind, I mumble under my breath. Don't be rude. Matt puts an arm around my shoulders in an attempt to calm me down. Take it easy, kid. You're not in California anymore. I shrug him off violently. Yeah, really? What tipped you off? The swamp gas? The possum B.O.? The fact that we haven't seen an In-N-Out burger for 200 miles? You must be starving, Ivory says smoothly. I've got some good news for you there. Early dinner is being served right now. You have to try our burgers. They are world-renowned. I struggle to get my whirling mind under control. If this was San Francisco, I'd tell everybody to stick it and Uber home. But I don't know if Uber comes way out to the sticks. And even if they do, I no longer have a phone to call them on. It goes without saying that I'm not spending the next six weeks of my life in this freak show wellness camp. But for right now, I accept the fact that I'm stuck. The Range Rover belongs to the Oasis, not me. So there's no way back to Little Rock and the Gulf Stream if Ms. Meditation doesn't approve. For all I know, the plane isn't there anymore. Vlad probably had them fly it back to California so we can go all over the place. I can tell you where he won't go, that's for sure, to a wellness oasis. First thing tomorrow, I'm out of here if I have to walk. But right now, if I don't get some food, I'm going to face plant in the pine needles. I might as well check out these famous burgers Ivory's hyping. She points through the double doors. The dining hall is a larger building at the center of the cluster of cottages. Leave your bags. I'll have them brought to your cottage. Bon appetit and be whole. Whole? What now? Whole, she amends, emphasizing the uh sound. It's an entire, your mind, body, and spirit. Be your whole self. <laughs> like I could be anybody else? The only hole I want a place I want is a place to crawl into until this nightmare is over. So Matt and I go to the dining hall. The sign over the entrance reads Nourishment for the Body. There's another building close by with a Nourishment for Your Soul sign. That must be where Ivy and her meditation hang out. Definitely history before anybody makes me go there. The dining hall is nicer than the school cafeteria, but it's basically a school cafeteria. They give you a tray, you pick out what you want, you go find a seat at one of the long communal tables. The private chefs from the good resort would probably drop dead if they had to work here. They won't let me take two burgers. The server explains, like she's talking to a five-year-old, that if I'm still hungry after I finish the first one, I can come back for seconds. Oh, I'll be hungry enough, I assure her. I'm so hungry I can barely focus on what a downer it is to be here. Because it's still early, there are only a few diners scattered around the big room. I wonder how long it took them to get to the top of the waiting list. No offense, but I have zero respect for anybody who comes here on purpose instead of being tricked into it by their dad. Matt waves me over to a spot by a big picture window. It has a view of the lake, which I can now see is a side pool of a long river. Pretty, isn't it? He offers. I don't answer. On an empty stomach, I can't muster enough sarcasm to come up with a vicious reply he deserves. I plop myself in the chair, grab my burger with both hands, take a gigantic bite, and spit it out so hard that it decorates the picture window. That's not a burger, I choke. Sure it is, Matt replies airily. A veggie burger. A what? The Oasis is 100% vegetarian, he informs me, like it's the most obvious thing in the world. I reach for my pocket, determined to call Vlad and demand to be taken out of this backwoods torture chamber or else. That's when I remember my phone and all my electronics are locked away at the Welcome Center. All this wellness is going to kill me. Chapter 2. Grace Atwater Awakening is my favorite part of the day. Not the waking up part, although that's pretty good too. I love waking up and remembering that I'm at the Oasis, the healthiest place on earth for your body and mind. Awakening isn't the same as waking up, not here anyway. It's the morning routine, a combination of stretching, breathing exercises, yoga, and tai chi. Everybody does awakening, 
but it's especially great for the kids because our awakening pathfinder is none other than Magnus Fellini himself. He's the founder and the heart of soul, heart and soul of the Oasis Mind and Body Wellness. This amazing retreat center was all his idea. His dream, really. Only, unlike most dreamers, he had the guts to drop out of the rat race and build his dream into a reality. I'm so lucky that I get to come here with mom every summer. She's a big fan, too. It's like we can finally detox from all the poisons we pick up during ordinary life. And not just the unhealthy food. I'm a vegetarian year-round. Think about things like pollution, lack of exercise, stress, addiction to electronics. So much negativity. All that disappears when you step onto the grounds of the oasis. You can still feel the bad stuff draining out of you. Some kids have a hard time giving up their phones while they're here, but after the first day or so, it's so much better. What's so great about staying in touch with the outside world when, when what we really need to be in touch with is ourselves? That's what Magnus says anyway. I love everything about this place. Actually, almost everything. There are no pets allowed at the Oasis, so we have to leave Benito at home with Dad. He's my miniature schnauzer. Benito, not Dad. Good thing Dad doesn't come to the center with us, or else Benito would have to go to a kennel. And he'd hate that. He's safe, though. Dad refuses to come with us until the Oasis starts to serve real cheeseburgers, and that's never going to happen. Reach for the treetops, Magnus instructs us in his quiet voice that somehow seems to fill the whole clearing. His fingertips flutter. Feel the negative energy leaving your body. I really can. I love that. Magnus is built like my father, minus the pot belly. His healthy lifestyle has turned him into an ad for his place, compact and muscular. You can picture him in a suit, like the Wall Street executive he used to be. Of course, now he's in his track suit. Uh, he has one in every color. Today's is magenta. And slowly bring your arms back to your center. Only Magnus can stretch slowly into an 11-syllable word. And I do, along with the other 12 kids at the Oasis between the ages of 8 and, eight, eight and 16. Psst, I hiss at Tyrell Carrington, who's exercising on the yoga mat directly in front of me. More stretching, less scratching. He turns to face me, and I can see that his neck and arms are dotted with bright red splotches. I can't help it, he whispers back. I'm so itchy. Did you eat the spinach again? I accuse. You know it'll give you a rash. I didn't. Honesty. They switched me to kale and look what it did to me. I broke out in hives. I cluck sympathy. Poor Tyrell could be the poster boy for calamine lotion, except it turns out he's allergic to that too. He might be allergic to air. I've never seen him when he wasn't digging away at some body part, making it redder and more inflamed. We're down to our mats doing some yoga positions when I first see the new kid. He's about my age. He looks like he's still half asleep, and the half that's awake is really unhappy. In fact, he's barely moving under his own power. It's more like he's being dragged here by this older guy. His dad? Nah, too young. Older brother, maybe. But if so, a lot older. At least 25. The older one spreads out a mat on the back of our group, and the kid curls up on it like he's trying to take a nap. His companion hurls him upright. The wrestling match is starting to get awkward. Who's that? Tyrell wonders aloud. Whoever it is, I reply in a low voice. He needs this place more than the rest of us put together. You can practically feel the negativity coming off him. Magnus provides the answer. Ah, newcomer. I want everyone to welcome Jet. Be whole, Jet, we all chorus. He looks at us like we're crazy. The older guy nudges him. Yeah. Happy to meet you too, Jet mumbles. Magnus takes us through the rest of Awakening, but I can't concentrate anymore. I keep glancing back at that guy, Jet, who's doing everything wrong. He isn't reaching for the treetops. He's barely even reaching. His shorts are on inside out, and his t-shirt isn't even from the Oasis. Instead of Be Whole, it says Sophie Tuppelman's Bat Mitzvah. And every time the older guy lets go of him, he drops to the mat and starts faking snoring. Or maybe it's real. I try to ignore him, but it's just so disrespectful, not just to us and the Oasis, but to Magnus himself, and right to his face. Magnus's sharp eyes are on me. Behold, Grace, did we miss our deepest breath? 
I practically sink through the forest floor from the humiliation. He's right. I was so distracted by that awful jet person that I neglected my deep breathing, which is the most important part of awakening. Sorry. As always, Magnus is cool about it. No need to be sorry. You just need to be whole. But I feel everybody staring at me for the first of the half, rest of the half hour. I'm usually Magnus' best student, so it hurts that much more. When it's over and Magnus releases us to go to the bath, I wheel on the new kid, who is back on his mat, dozing off again. It's called awakening, I tell him bitterly. You should try it sometime. He opens one eye. I'm awake. Yeah, right, I snort. You're flat on your face when your brother isn't holding you upright. He's not my brother, he yawns. He's my parole officer. The older guy tries to laugh it off. Matt Luganus, he introduces himself, shaking my hand. I'm Jet's companion. Don't listen to him, Jet insists. He's my dog groomer and part-time scuba instructor. Jet, Matt begins warningly. All right, I admit it. He's me from the year 2036. Ever since we invented that time machine, he's been traveling back to make sure our father doesn't discover me, doesn't disown me, which means the checks will stop coming in the, in the future. Matt rolls his eyes. Your father doesn't do checks. He uses his blockchain technology, Flash, cat, flash Cash. Tyrell scratches way over. But isn't Flash Cash a Fuego product? His jaw drops. You mean your dad is Vladimir Baranov? Jet gets to his feet. That's the old man. He also invented Cluster Vault, uh, Bite Ball, Bolt, Luau, and Kicking Horse Pass. Okay, not the last one. That's a place in Canada. You get used to you get used to Jet's sense of humor, Matt says dryly. At least so I'm told. I already know everything about Jet that there is to know, and it can be summed up in three words. Spoiled rich kid. Wow, Tyrell enthuses. Your dad is considered the greatest American innovator since Thomas Edison. You guys must be loaded. I elbow him in the midsection. Tyrell shrugs. He knows he's loaded. Everybody uses Fuego. I've got an F-phone. Jet is suddenly interested. You got a phone? Not on me, Tyrell admits. I had to hand it over and we checked in. No electronics allowed. You see, Matt says to Jet, we're all in the same boat. It isn't some special torture your dad dreamed up just for you. Don't be a hole, Jet draws on his, draws on his companion. See, I'm starting to get the hang of the place. I see red. It's the be, it's be whole, and you know it, I exclaim angrily. It's encouragement to live a better life, and you're turning, in, turning it into something gross. You're right, I'm a bad person, Jet agrees. You should complain about me to Nimbus and get me kicked out. He has the nerve, nerve to point to Magnus, who built this wonderful place. A pampered creep like Jet isn't worthy to add fabric softener to the laundry when Magnus washes his tracksuit. Magnus Fellini, I hiss, is Pathfinder to the Pathfinders, our leader. So, tell him what a jerk I am, he encourages me. Not going to happen, Jet, Matt informs him solemnly. Take it from your scuba instructor. You're here for the whole six weeks. We should get over to the bath, Tyrell puts in. We're already late. Not me, Jet says stoutly. If I have to stay here and starve, at least I'm going to smell bad. It's not that kind of bath, I snap. It's a natural spring, warmed by geothermal heat. There are only a handful like it anywhere. But that's not good enough for Jet Baranoff. If he wants to experience a great wonder of nature... His dad can just invent one and give it to him for his birthday. He starts bickering with Matt over whether or not he should have to suffer what other people save up for their whole lives to have the chance to experience. I grab Tyrell and we head through the woods toward the bath. Tyrell can't stop peering back over his shoulder in the direction of the argument. I can't believe Jeff's Jet's dad is Vladimir Baranov. He was named one of the ten richest people on earth, you know. Yeah, well, then money doesn't care who owns it, I retort. Where does Jet get off? When he trashes the Oasis, he isn't just insulting Magnus and the other Pathfinders. It's a slap in the face to every single one of us. It's only his first day, Tyrell reminds me. This place takes him getting used to. When I first got here, I wasn't exactly thrilled either. And now you love it, right? I prompt. Well, he begins. 
Okay, maybe you're not the greatest example, I concede. It's tough to be whole when your entire body's a giant rash. It's not that, he admits. It's my family. You and your mom came here for wellness, but my parents are treating this place like a weight loss clinic. Maybe I don't want to lose weight. You don't have to, I reason. The food here is awesome. For you, you're vegetarian already. And then there's my sister. She misses her boyfriend Landon. How's that your problem? It's everybody's problem, he explains. Sarah hates everybody in the world, and that includes me. He points to the welts on his neck. Not all these are hives, you know. She hit me with a hot chestnut during the nut roast last night. I've met Sarah a couple times. She's 17, so she's aged out of most of the kid stuff here at the Oasis. She talks about this guy Landon a lot, that's for sure. Like when Tyrell stubbed his toe, she mentioned that Landon loves stubbed Stubbs barbecue sauce. I try to put myself in her shoes. Must be tough here at the, the Oasis, where she can't call or FaceTime or even text. They write letters to each other, he supplies, disgusted. Old school, like three times a day. When we get to the bath, most of the kids are already in the water. Tyrell and I duck into the change booths to put on our swimsuits. The bath is an irregular shaped pool nestled in a natural rock formation. It's a little tricky to get in, but at least the rocks are smooth so you can go barefoot. It's a shock when you first feel the water because it's so hot. I mean, not just hot tub hot, but a couple of notches above that. Magnum says the water is heated for by magna, magma far underground. Sometimes you get the feeling that if you dig around with your toe, you could burn it off because the magma must be right there. There's a cloud of steam coming over the bath on even the hottest days. But once you get used to it, you'll experience total relaxation and a greater sense of well-being than you've ever known before. It's a perfect finishing touch to awakening, the cherry on top. Tyrell lets out a content, contented, ah, uh, as he sinks in right up to his neck. It's impossible to be itchy in the bath. All you feel is the tingle of the heated water on your skin. I like to pinch my nose and go all the way under. The sulfur in the water stings my eyes a little, but it's as good as a facial from a high-priced salon. I resurface and lie back against the rocks in near-perfect contentment. A raucous bellow jars me out of my thoughts. Cannonball! There's a sound of pounding feet and a figure is airborne above the bath, blotting out the sun. Jet hits the water in the middle of everyone, scattering kids and raising a splash like a meteorite strike. Wait for it, I tell myself. The scream comes out almost immediately, ripped straight from the gut, an eruption of pure shock and anguish. Yow! That's when we learn that Jet Baranoff can fly. He lifts out of the burning water like a submarine-launched missile, missile and scrambles up onto the rocks, trembling and pink all over. That guy Matt comes running. Jet, what happened? They tried to kill me, Jet howls. Ooh, Matt gawks at his boss's son, who is crouched like a wounded animal in his soaked shorts and t-shirt. All the kids are laughing, including me. Especially me. It's a billion degrees in there, Jeff whimpers. Why didn't anybody warn me? We thought you'd figure it out, I snicker. You know, from the sign that says, Hot Spring. I need a doctor, Jet tells his companion. Tell the pilot to fire up the Gulf Stream, and we'll need a chopper, stat, to get me to Little Rock. Matt's patient. Are you finished? He asks. Get a grip. You're not dead. Everything's still attached. All these other kids are in the same water you were in, and none of them need medevac. The minute I get my phone back, Jet seethes, I'm telling Vlad you tried to boil me alive. I believe him. I can totally picture Jet getting a per person fired because he's embarrassed about making an idiot out of himself. But then Matt laughs in his face. All right, Michael Phelps, let's get back to the cottage and get you some dry clothes. You can use my towel if you want, Tyrell offers. Jet stares at him. What is wrong with you? To the rest of us, he adds. You're all crazy! Before stor storming off, Matt hurrying behind him. I'm not laughing anymore. There's nothing funny about Jet Baranoff. Don't let him, don't lend him your towel, I tell Tyrell. He wouldn't give us the skin off a grape, and we should return the favor. Come on, Grace, he replies. Haven't you ever had a hard time fitting in somewhere? The answer is yes, obviously, we all have. Which is another reason I appreciate the Oasis. 
This is where I fit in better than any place in the whole world. And I don't intend to let a spoiled rich kid from Silicon Valley ruin my time here.